From the 1800s until the 1990s, the Canadian government funded and ran a number of residential schools. From the outset, the goal was to educate the children of the indigenous people in ways deemed more civilised and to assimilate them into Western culture. Children were taken away from their homes and kept away from their parents, their language and their culture in a bid to destroy all trace of their way of life. What happened to these children has left deep scars in the communities, ruined countless lives and resulted in the deaths of an estimated 6,000 children and many of them buried in unmarked graves. In today's video, we will discuss the reasons behind such schools, what the survivors experienced and the steps taken to address this historical wrong. Prior to the European settlement, the indigenous peoples of Canada were organised into hundreds of distinct territories, known as the First Nations. The implementation of the residential schools can be traced back to early missionary schools. These church-run institutions were designed to civilise the native populations, a view based on colonial imperialism and cultural supremacy. This was to be achieved by indoctrinating the children into European and Christian ways of living with the goal of assimilating them into a white society. These schools were pushed in the early 1800s in tandem with the other attempts to pull the indigenous populations away from their nomadic lifestyles, such as encouraging agriculture. This approach was formalised in 1844 in a report from the Bago Commission. Amongst many other matters pertaining to the indigenous people, it made recommendations to control Indian affairs, identifying that this could be achieved through the assimilation and education of native children. Many of the recommendations were codified in the Indian Act of 1857, which encroached on many aspects of the indigenous people's lives with the goal to westernise the First Nations. It also provided government funding to the Catholic and Anglican missionary schools. The Canadian government took inspiration from the industrial schools for indigenous children in the United States and began to take control of the missionary schools and formally established the residential schools in 1883, though in many instances they were still run by the church. As stated before, the goal of the residential schools was to eradicate all aspects of the indigenous people's culture by taking the youth of the generation and separating them from their homes, families and traditions. On arrival, students had their hair cut short, they were dressed into uniforms designed to westernise them and very often they were referred to by numbers. Their daily routine was strictly controlled by stringent timetables. All of the First Nation languages were banned. Whilst boys and girls were kept in the same institutions, they were kept apart. Even brothers and sisters were separated in this manner, with often violent punishments for mixing. Visits from family were heavily restricted with children rarely allowed to leave for the holidays or breaks. Many of the parents would often camp outside the school in hopes of seeing their children. But the past system that kept the First Nation peoples on the reserves heavily restricted this. And for many of the parents, it wasn't even an option as their children were often sent hundreds of miles away. Whilst children were permitted to write letters to their parents, letters would be screened so that the news leaving the institutions was hidden. Although they were referred to as residential schools, the level of education provided was minimal. Supplies would be surplus from the schools for Europeans and the teachers often lacked adequate training and motivation. Instead, the children were taught practical Western skills. For girls, education focused on homely duties, cooking, doing the laundry and how to look after the home. For boys, focus was on carpentry, agriculture and metalworking. In addition to their training, the children were expected to help run the schools. This would be having the children run maintenance or have them grow their own food to eat. These initiatives were designed to cut costs and have the institutions as self-reliant as possible. This was also at the expense of the children's formal education, meaning when they left at 18 years old, they would leave with little more than a primary level of education. Whilst the separation of the children can be seen as bad enough, the horrendous treatment of the First Nation children only makes the residential schools that much worse. They were often called dirty or stupid or no good unless they committed to the assimilation process. Corporal punishment was seen as the standard, beatings for using their indigenous language or for engaging in ways that were seen contrary to assimilation were the norm. Even just talking about traditions or culture was to be punished. 
Some survivors even reported having needles shoved into their tongues for speaking their native language. More often than not, such beatings were done in front of other children as a means to instill the consequences of engaging in their culture. There are even reports of the children having to engage in violently punishing each other for infractions as minor as wetting the bed. SA of the children by those working at the institutions was unfortunately a regular occurrence. It is estimated that around 5,000 of these individuals committed serious SA against minors under their care. Many of the schools were run by churches which operated in the same manner seen around the world, where those responsible were protected by the culture of secrecy and cover-ups. Very often, they would just move to another institution without punishment. It is estimated that between 50 and 70% of the children were subjected to some form of SA. Due to these horrific conditions, the death rates of those at the residential schools were much higher than the national average. In 1907, a government medical inspector named Peter Henderson Bryce reported that between 15 and 25% of the previously healthy indigenous children across Canada were dying whilst at the residential schools. This, however, does not reflect those ill children who were sent home to die, as was the common practice. Bryce reported that the children were not given sufficient food and were living in squalid conditions and denied proper medical treatment. Whilst he suggested a number of improvements, his report was never published by the Canadian authorities and no improvements were made. This attitude of the government being well aware of the conditions, yet being unwilling to make changes, was par for the course for the duration of the residential school system. Even as the residential school system slowly wound down, other methods are seen to have been employed to assimilate the indigenous children. From the 1960s to the 1980s, thousands of children were taken from their homes and placed with white foster homes, in what is referred to as the 60s scoop. Whilst indigenous children made up around 5% of the population, they represented 20% of all children in care. In some territories, the number would be as high as 70%. Many of the children placed into foster care would never return to their parents. Due to the amendments in the Indian Act, the 60s scoop particularly affected single mothers as they were not allowed to live with their children on the reservations. It became common practice that newborn babies were taken from their mothers. A judicial inquiry was launched in the 1980s headed by Judge Edwin Kimmelman, which found, quote, The term best interests of the child had been wrought with cultural bias in a system dominated by white middle-class workers, boards of directors, administrators, lawyers, and judges. They also alleged that in the application of the legislation, there were many factors which were crucially important to the native people, which had been ignored, misinterpreted, or simply not recognized by the children welfare system. By the 1990s, the residential school system was in the process of being completely wound down, with the last school closing in 1996. But also, in the 1990s, began a major push for recognition of the crimes. At this point, entire generations of indigenous people had experienced the same trauma, with older relatives coming to grips with the fact the younger generations had faced what they had often in the same schools. This can perhaps be best explained by Chief George Gurin. He said, I tried very hard not to cry when I was being beaten, and I can still just turn off my feelings. And I'm a lucky man. Many of the men my age either didn't make it, ended their lives, or died violent deaths, or alcohol got them. And it wasn't just my generation. My grandmother, who's in her late 90s, to this day, it's just too painful for her to talk about what's happened at her school. On the 30th of October 1990, Phil Fontaine, the head of the Assembly of the Monotoba Chiefs, gave a televised interview where he explained what he and many others had experienced. This was perhaps the first public explanation by a survivor of the residential homes, and hoped to encourage more survivors to begin the healing and reconciliation process. Since then, there have been concerted efforts by both the indigenous people and the Canadian government to address these crimes. In 2006, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement was reached. This agreement established compensation for the survivors of the schools 
and set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Despite delays and issues of leadership, the Commission was able to compile thousands of testimonies and obtain around one million government documents on how the schools were run. But one of the darkest projects established by the Commission was the Missing Children Project. In 1917, the Department of Indian Affairs ceased recording the deaths of children under their care. Since the 1990s, countless unmarked graves have been uncovered on or near the sites of the former schools. The vast number of those who died were victims of tuberculosis, exacerbated by the poor conditions. In 2021, a large number of unmarked graves were uncovered, prompting more searches at the sites of the former schools. This renewed public interest has led to 1,400 unmarked graves of children being uncovered in 2021 alone. There can be no doubt as to the aims of the residential school system. From its outset until the 20th century, those in charge used the schools to destroy and fragment the indigenous way of life. One notable example of such a mindset can be seen in a quote from Duncan Campbell Scott. Scott was a deputy minister of Indian Affairs and was in charge of the residential school system from 1913 to 1932. In 1920, he is quoted as saying, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. I do not think as a matter of fact that the country ought to continuously protect a class of people who are unable to stand alone. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic. The damage done to the indigenous people of Canada by these policies has been catastrophic. Entire generations have been affected, but it is important to remember this is but one of many attempts to destroy the traditional way of life. The motivations were to destroy a culture deemed inferior by the European settlers and continue to be a policy for hundreds of years adopted by the Canadian government. There are many that believe the residential schools in particular constitute a genocide. Notably, the definition of forcibly transferring children with the goal to destroy a culture. This is still an ongoing and developing story, with more unmarked graves to be uncovered and bodies to be identified and returned home. I will be including links in the description to the stories of the survivors. I would strongly advise you to take the time to listen to a few to better understand what these people endured as children. It is a difficult watch, but one necessary for us all to understand the consequences of such policies, not only on the individuals, but how it destroyed entire communities.